So I think the first philosophy that I ever came across uh, was probably in Sophie's World, uh, which is a book um, about a little girl who uh, has all these experiences with engaging with different philosophers and different ideas. Uh, and, and I think I was given this book to read because uh, I may have been a slightly stroppy teenager uh, and the, the idea was that arguing and reflecting on philosophy would be a, a good thing for me to do and someone thought this would be a fun book for me to read. I guess maybe I was 13, 14 when someone gave me this and I read it and thought it was really interesting and, and from then on just, just got more and more interested in it. Did philosophy make you less stroppy? Uh, I think philosophy might have enabled me to be more better to, to better articulate my stroppiness. So recently, what the department's been doing uh, is taking out a series of philosophy workshops, uh, if you like, into local primary schools. And the idea has been that we take a bit of research that's done in the department, uh, and we try and package it up into a small little workshop. And we go out into a primary school, we run it for about one hour, and we have six of these. So for a six-week block, we're going out working with kids in the local area uh, and teaching them really to engage in philosophy. So for instance, uh, one of the, the sessions we work on uh, is what is beauty? And of course, that's a huge and really, really difficult sort of question to deal with. So what we do to start with is we give them six pictures, we give them 10 minutes, we put them into groups, and we say, order them from most beautiful to least beautiful. And then we'll have a chat and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the philosophically interesting aspects of that. So there we've got the picture of, uh, of a kitten and then we've got the picture of an of a industrial power station. So the age of the kids we've worked with has varied a little bit. Uh, we've worked with children from about six or seven years old right up to 11 years old. So no, no introduction needed for that picture. Although though almost universally they think that this is not beautiful. This is really ugly because um, she's ugly. Uh, then we have a picture of a, of a model taken from some magazine. Uh, again, they tend to think that, that that's fairly ugly as well. Nah, she's quite nice looking at it. What do you think? <laughs> uh, my wife may be watching this video, so... <laughs> uh, Is that not her? No, that's, that's not her. Uh, she's obviously far more beautiful than uh, that. So that's a picture of a rubbish dump. That gets universal agreement. Normally, they, the kids react to start with with a little bit of suspicion. Right? So here you are, this intruder coming into their school, they've never met you. Uh, and often as well, you know, coming from the university, there can be a preconception about what that brings with it. Um, and then you ask them the first question and, and straight away they have all of these fantastic ideas. So again, talking to them about what is beauty, they'll say things like, we have a picture of a, of a shiny sports car. Uh, and, and typically then the boys get really excited and they start coming out with all these fantastic ideas about what might make that car a beautiful thing. So it's shiny, it's sick. My mate's dad once saw one of these in this street in London that was really posh. Um, but they're, they're totally freewheeling and they'll draw connections all over the place. It's really exciting to work with them. Getting those, those ideas back uh, to something a bit more philosophically constrained uh, requires that what we do is we, we get them back from their groups. So they, they've done this ordering, they've worked out what the order of the pictures is from least beautiful to most beautiful, uh, and then say, right, okay guys, why? What, what, what makes this thing more beautiful than that thing? Why have you put them in the orders that you have? If you like, justify your decisions. I mean, a huge part of philosophy is being able to argue for and articulate your reasons for thinking that something is the case. And uh, so once we've got them engaged in that freewheeling exercise, it's then a case of, right, explain yourself, defend your view, um, and, and you know, when you talk to other groups, and you've got a group of boys who've put the sports car as most beautiful, and then we have another picture in which uh, there's, a, there's a picture of a lovely sunset, and sometimes you, you know, it's, it's inevitably a group of boys with the car, a group of girls with the sunset. Come on, guys, talk about it. Who, who's right here? Do you know what I'm going to ask you to do now? Go for it. Rank them. Rank them myself. You rank them. You put them here on the oh, table. You rank them okay. Order. Okay, so what do I think? I think that that probably is the most beautiful. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There we go. Then the car, and the power station, and then the rubbish dump. So that's your order, is it? That's my order. We think that there's no lower age limit on doing philosophy. And we think that doing philosophy is just enormously valuable, uh, just in and of itself. Uh, good philosophers are good at doing all sorts of other things. Uh, and, and philosophy is just fantastically interesting. So we think 
let's go out, talk to kids, get them doing the philosophy for themselves. What would your order be then? <laughs> I'd, put, I'd put her there. Nah. I'd put her above the Mona Lisa. Put the sunset top. And then I'd put... The cat's cute, not beautiful, so I'd put the car there. And then I'd put the... I quite like power stations, so I'd put the power station there. And the rubbish dump there. I think typically um, children start to be introduced to philosophy somewhere around 16, uh, 17. So, Sometimes they might get to do a philosophy AS level, they might get to do a bit of critical thinking a little bit before that, which is sometimes connected to bits of philosophy. Uh, but, but at least typically, philosophy just doesn't get into the curriculum uh, beneath that kind of age range. You know, primary school teachers are very busy teaching children lots of other things. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it doesn't normally creep in until much later. I think people are a, a disinclined to give philosophy to primary school aged children because there is this preconception that kicks around that in order to do philosophy you've somehow got to be just really really clever um, you've got to have this really you've already got to have a grasp of high level abstract principles um, and I guess I think that preconception's false I think you know just working with these seven year olds just shows me that, that, that that's not right there are a couple of really good reasons for getting philosophy in early. One's just to do with the nature of the subject itself. So one of the things that we go out uh, and work with with the children concerns morality and moral reasoning and thinking about what it is for a, an act to be good as opposed to uh, an act being, being bad. Th these children have got to grow up, they've got to be adults, they've got to learn to behave in, in mature and reflective kind of ways. And, and I think that teaching them how to reason and work through their actions and think about what kind of guiding principles they might like to employ, I think that's fantastically useful. I think that there's a real difference between the way that, say, a seven-year-old would engage with a philosophical problem from the way that a first-year undergraduate would engage with a philosophical problem and then maybe a member of academic staff. Um, so, so let, let's start with the undergraduate, right? Because they're my sort of typical teaching kind of, kind of material. They, they come to us in their first year. They, they've been taught a lot of things uh, about how to write, how to think, how to perform. And typically, they've been asked to do that in a very structured kind of way. Um, when you start working with the seven-year-olds in the primary school, you've got none of that. And it's brilliant. They just, you, you never, ever know what is going to come out next. And, and from many points of view, that's awesome, because you have this little team then of, of 15 in the group who are attacking a philosophical problem from just, just impossible angles, angles that aren't going to work, angles that are, um, but they have no preconception of where they should start. So they just go from wherever they are, and that's, that's brilliant to work with. Um, interestingly, colleagues are a kind of a mishmash of those two things. Um, so they've been taught how to think in very particular and structured kinds of ways, but typically because they're philosophers, they've also been trained in a sense to try and ignore a lot of that structure and just think about the issues as they are. So I think kind of if, if you mix a, a, a primary school philosopher with an undergrad with a bit more experience, you, you wind up with a, an academic philosopher.